Okay, my name is Paula Dove Jennings. I was born uh, July 3rd, 1940. I was born in Providence, Rhode Island, mm -hmm. raised the first 15 years in Charlestown, and uh, over here ever since. We are located at the Tomaquag Indian Museum in Exeter, Rhode Island. And I am Paula's mom, Eleanor Dove. I was born in 1918 in Providence, moved to Charlestown. I married in 1938, and we moved to Charlestown, I think it was around 1940 or 51, something no, like that. 40. 40, yeah. And you know what, just take one look. Um, and the two of you feel free to interrupt each other and add and clarify things. That was perfect okay. what you just said about that. So, um, Eleanor, I'm going to start with you and ask you what your uh, earliest memories of Hope Valley, actually from Charlestown and Hope Valley and Exeter, what your earliest memories of this place are. You were already married, so you were mm -hmm. raising a family. Well, like I said, we lived in, I came from East Providence, married first in 1938. Moved down to Charlestown on Bucky Brook Trail. It was really a job because I worked at the Providence Art Club for a number of years and I understood that the caretakers were leaving Chumawaukee Lodge. So I asked Judge Lyman, what did this job entail? So he said, well, you had a cottage for yourself and the lodge was next door to it. And when they came down, they expected the lodge to be clean and for me to cook the food, and my husband served it. So I said, we went down and looked at it, way in the middle of the woods, and I decided I liked it. So we went back, and I went back to work the following Monday. Judge Lyman came in, and I told him we'd like the job. So we took it. And we stayed down there, how many years? 15 years. About, about 15 years. And the lodge had sort of dwindled off. The members were dying. They were not taking new, new members. And they came to me and talked about putting the place up for sale. Well, of course, I was all gung-ho for it. But First, I had talked to my mother and father where they kind of back us, like all young people go to their parents. <laughs> and, but it fell through, and we, did, we didn't, so we're not able to buy it. You thought of buying the Chumawaki? Yes, yeah. But then, then, they, then they took it off the market completely anyway and gave it to the state. And this lodge was, consisted of all lawyers. I can remember Judge Lyman very, the most because he had a, a daughter, and I thought she was so striking because she was tall and redheaded. <laughs> and then there was uh, Mr. Tillinghast. He was a lawyer also. Well, anyway, we took the job and, uh, and had the caretaker's cottage next door. And we thought that was wonderful because by that time we had moved to Providence and we were paying rent, I don't remember what, but I suppose it was around 15 or 18 dollars a month for rent in those days. So we were going to have a place free so we could save some money and buy our own place. <laughs> and uh, so we took the job and I did all the cooking and most of the cleaning and then I did the laundry for five cents a piece, whether it was a napkin or a sheet which you ironed in those days. <laughs> but we were happy there. There was lots of land with the Chemawaki Lodge and a wonderful, wonderful blueberry patch so that we picked blueberries. And my husband, when they had steak, he cooked them on the fireplace and I did the rest of the cooking and so forth. But it made a nice place to bring up children, my first two children. They were born in Providence and they were born when we moved down there. But when I lived there, uh, the two younger children were, no, the, the middle daughter was born while I lived there. Laura was born after we came up here. What is oh, the what? name? Yeah. 
one thing she's not telling you, uh, there was no electricity. Right. <laughs> there was no plumbing. Um, I and I was a city girl. <laughs> and she was a city girl, a former model at Rhode Island School of Design. And um, in the, there was a front hall closet that was filled with things from when she did her modeling. There was satin and, <laughs> and velvet gowns and leopard coats and uh, fabulous things that I got to play with. And because we only had wood stoves to heat the house, uh, in the wintertime I had the pleasure of not only having blankets and quilts on my bed, but I also was covered with my mother's full-length leopard coat. <laughs> and the leopard coat was lined with green wool. And if you yeah. don't think that's ritzy, <laughs> I mean, you get up in the morning and you empty the pot and you wash the, the, the lampshades and, and trim the wick and you go outside. If, if, uh, first, we didn't even have a pump in the house. Eventually, we got ritzy and we had a hand pump in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, go outside to get the water and um, my, my mother's job was uh, making sure the breakfast was ready because my father always had other jobs and she would get the fire going and the milk, because we didn't have a uh, refrigerator, we had the ice box, we had a block of ice and the milk would sit outside in the window sometimes and she would have to bring it in uh, and the was whole milk in milk bottles and where it would freeze but not the, 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 the cream would be sitting up, puffed up over the top. <laughs> but when my father came down for breakfast, and then my brother and I, the, the main room of the house would be all nice and warm, and she would feed us and spoil <laughs> us and take good care of us. And mm -hmm. it was a great place to grow up. Mm -hmm. One of the strange, funniest things about it was when we first moved down there, my mother-in-law and my oldest sister-in-law come driving in, and I was outside and they came out and looked to see what I was doing. And I was trying to chop wood. I had never had an ax in my hand before. And my mother-in-law said, what are you doing? So I said, well, I have to have supper ready and first to leave my wood. So she said, well, did you ever cut wood before? So I said, no. So she said, all right, I will cut enough wood for you to get this supper going, seeing as you have to get supper going. She said, if you never have a knife, don't learn. An or you, I mean an ax. Don't learn because you'll be cutting wood the rest of your life. <laughs> so I never did learn to cut wood because she said, if he doesn't leave enough, then there won't be any supper. So, <laughs> so he would cut the wood because she really got after him about that. He'd cut the wood and he'd have it stacked up to the ceiling. Or when he got home, I'd have it burnt. If you stacked it three quarters, I'd have it burnt. <laughs> Half, I'd make it last so that that lasted. So I got to be a pretty good fire keeper, wood fire keeper. But by the but, time I was about nine, it was converted to uh, a garrisine so that, which mm. was much easier for her <laughs> to handle. And it wasn't too long after that that uh, they had electricity put in the house. So our whole lifestyle changed. Uh, one of the uh, owners of the lodge said it was okay if we had electricity, which we had to pay for the poles to come down there, but no poles could be in front of the lodge. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a, a, a major thing to make sure that no electricity was on, on that side of the, the driveway. But uh, I had gone to school or been away for the weekend and I came home and I cried like a baby because my mother was all proud because she had a white porcelain kitchen sink <laughs> and I wanted that old black ironstone sink <laughs> that I had grown up with. <laughs> but we lived there till uh, uh, I was 15 and my mother, my father after 1949 managed to get a new car every other year and um, my, my mother, he was looking at a new car, and my mother said, no new car until I can get a house of my own. And they, buying the lodge fell through, and my fa mother had a real estate agent looking, uh, Mr. Pansera, Louis Mr. Pansera. Louis Pansera, looking for a place for, for Well, I, I had found this place on Wachog Pond. Belonged to a doctor, I forgot his name. But anyhow, I was all for that, and uh, 
but I couldn't get up the money for it. And then I heard about, oh no, Louis, told, Louis Pansara told me about this place. And when I told my husband that Mr. Pansara was going to come and show us this place up in Arcadia, and he said, there's nothing up in Arcadia but a bunch of mill houses I know. I said, how do you know? So he said, well, because he was in the CCC down on the Arcadia Road, and he says, there's nothing but the mill, mill houses up there. But where the fish hatchery is now was a dance hall. And of course, from the fish hatchery, he had never, I mean, from the CC camp, he had never gone any further than the dance hall. So he didn't know what was around the corner. <laughs> and, and it was the Democrats. And the, I'd, I'd like to immediately. When we came, nobody had lived here for six years. Mm -hmm. There were trees everywhere. There was no yard. Uh, we came in, because my brother and I were fascinated by it because we kept counting doors and we kept saying, there were seven doors going outside, but we went outside, we could only see six doors. And that was because the front door was totally covered by trees. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was great fun moving in here because there was a lot of work to be done. Uh, one of the strange things, there were no doorknobs, um, but uh, I got to choose the biggest room and I, I loved that. Um, but my family members, my mother's family and my father's family and close friends and, and Indian people that were, were good friends like Dan Congdon, his name was uh, Chief White Oak and he was married to Red Wing. They would come during the week and on the weekend and help uh, repair windows, to paint, to clean, to put doorknobs on, uh, whatever needed to be done. And uh, one of my, my bedroom was one of the last rooms and, uh, to be done. And my mother would go to downtown Westerly and pick out wallpaper and paint. Well, for some reason, green was the color of choice for me. But she had picked out wallpaper because I was late getting to the store with these big cabbage patch roses. <laughs> and I hated it. <laughs> and so being 15 years old and knowing everything there is to know, I chose this awful dark green to go on one wall to counteract all of this big cabbage patch flowers. Well, Dan Condon came and uh, there were wide beam floors which he painted and the wallpaper was up and the green on the one wall and he put on a crystal uh, doorknob on my bedroom door which was to please me. But when you open the door he had sitting there a great big old-fashioned watering can for those old cabbage patch flowers. <laughs> 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 That's pretty. But is that this house here that you're this describing? This house, yes. 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 Now, is it a very old house? It was yes. Well, the original house, which is down the further end, was about half the size as it looks outside, was the mill owner's house. Mm -hmm. And then it was added onto in the Episcopal Diocese brought the facility mm -hmm. and this was the church where we now have the mm -hmm. museum. Uh, they would have young people come and had dormitories upstairs where the young people would come during the summer and uh, next door uh, what eventually became my, my parents restaurant uh, was a big building where they would have church suppers and bingo uh, parties and socials. Mm -hmm. uh, when I when we moved here, what is now the museum was my brother and my playroom. We had ping pong table and games and uh, we'd have record hops and sock hops and uh, DJs would sometimes come down and we had a lot of fun. The neighborhood people would come in and different tribal mm -hmm. members and family members would come. And when my parents had parties, which would be all adults, in the building next door they had twin beds all lined up in there and all the people would come and we would party and and have all kinds of good seafood and my mother's delicious cooking and um would be like a weekend party and um, they'd sleep over they would sleep over so it, it was it was a lot of fun uh growing up here my father kept a boat and a canoe which would be over at the pond and in those days um people didn't destroy property um, or take a, it. Or take it. The rule was you were, anybody in the neighborhood was allowed to use the rowboat and the canoe. It, they could either bring their own oars or they could come over and borrow ours. 
But after about seven or eight years, uh, some teenagers started sinking them, and so we had to drag them back and forth. But it was what great. What pond is that? What is it called? It's a man-made uh, pond called Barberville Pond. Mm -hmm. And of course, the big thing living out here in the country was to go to Hope Valley. Uh, Wyoming didn't have all the buildings that they have there now. We're going to Hope Valley. Um, you could go to the drugstore. You could go to the A&P. Uh, Trash and Treasure Shop. What else was down there? Wasn't there a Johnny Cake place? Places. Yes, Johnny there was. The there was a too. Johnny Cake place, right where that they have all those motors and things sitting yes. out in front. Yeah, of. yeah. I can't remember the name of that place. I can't remember. Browning store. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's store. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course, the main thing for my parents uh, was the bank, and um, my parents did their banking down at what was. Washington Trust, mm -hmm. Washington Trust on the still corner do, there. Do everything with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, because she was a, a proud mother. I have a younger sister who's 17 years younger than me, who was born uh, in Westerly, but you know, raised here. Um, she was uh, not quite like every other little child, and she was very determined on what she wanted. And one year, she wanted a dog for Christmas. And she didn't get the dog. And what happened? So I go into the Washington Trust when it was down there at the, yeah. the beer like this. And she's dragging the strings. Ever since Christmas, she would had the string and she dragged it everywhere she went. We walked into the bank and here she's got the string with her. So somebody there said, what is the string for, Laurie? And she says, can't you see my dog? <laughs> <laughs> she was bringing her dog, which was a thing on there, but in her imagination, because she had wanted a dog so much that so she just made herself believe she had a dog on that leash. <laughs> well, we'll talk about Lauren. Can you tell me the names of your children? And yes. Um, Mark Ferris is my first and only son. Then came Paula May. You're and not supposed to say that middle name. She did that on purpose. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> because she used to, if I was really like, you know, if I called her two or three times, the next time I was like, Paula May. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then came Dawn Cherie. And then Lori Kim. <laughs> and it's Lori that's running the school? No, no, no Lorena's my granddaughter. Granddaughter? Mm hmm. Is that Lori's daughter? That's uh, yeah. Dawn's daughter. Dawn's daughter. Yeah. yeah. Dawn was a teacher and Lorraine is a teacher and now Lorraine has her own school. Um, where did, speaking of school, where did uh, your children go to school? Well, the two older ones went to Pocketuck Valley and the uh, others went to Dawn and what's the name of the school down? Wawalum. Wow, yeah, Wawalum. Wow, That's an so you didn't go to Hope Valley School, but... No, I went to school in... in well, because we were in Exeter, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From the first grade to the eighth grade at Parkertuck Valley School, and I really disliked it that it was changed to Charlestown, because it was <laughs> always Parkertuck Valley. <laughs> uh, it was the same school that my father and his sister Marjorie and brother Phil attended. Uh, the old outhouses for the boys and girls were still out there and they were used to keep the, the equipment because there was a man, I don't remember his name, who would come and cut the grass and shovel the snow and all that equipment was kept in the outhouses. Until I was about uh, in the fourth grade, about 1949, uh, we didn't have toys or, or swing sets or things like that outside. But we had great fun because the day started off every day going outside, particularly in the good weather, and raising the flag and saying the Pledge of, the, of Allegiance. And I loved that. And I couldn't wait till I got to third or fourth grade so I could raise that flag. And of course, by that time they stopped doing it by the time I got old enough. But recess time, uh, we'd go outside and we'd sit on the rocks in the woods and we'd play hide and go seek or tag, or maybe there might be a ball for us to play with. And um, we had a wonderful time. Um, I remember when we got the seesaws and the swing set, um, 
I was impressed with them, but I thought the tiger tire swing my father had made for me at home was a lot better and a lot more fun uh, going there. It was, um, the school was like a, a family in a lot of different ways, although I was very frightened um, going there on the, on the school bus and afraid I wouldn't know anybody. And of course I didn't other than a brother and a couple of cousins that were older than myself. But um, I survived first grade and Miss Crandall, and that was hard. Mrs. Pine was my second grade teacher and she was phenomenal. Miss Fry was the meanest little woman you ever wanted to see. A lot of people honored her a few years ago, I guess about 15 years ago, how wonderful she was, but she was mean, mean, mean. <laughs> and um, she wore high heels and um, she just, she frustrated me because one of my cousins uh, had um, gotten sick with rheumatoid fever and was out of school for about six months and she came back and made all of up all of her work and she sh was supposed to be the valedictorian uh, when she graduation at the eighth grade and Miss Fry uh, persuaded the principal that really even though this one boy was a maybe a half a point behind her, that it would look better if a male uh, was the valedictorian. Well, my cousin, Holly Spears, um, was uh, not the valedictorian, but when she gave up and gave her speech, she brought down the house. She mm -hmm. really deserved it. And uh, it, was, it was phenomenal going to school there. Uh, we started playing baseball and softball outside. And that was great. Did you feel there was any prejudice against you? Sure. Um, there was a lot of prejudice, but people didn't recognize it as such. Um, it always frustrated me because at school, we learned about Indians at Thanksgiving time when everybody either got to play an Indian or play a, a colonist, and I couldn't play something that I was. And then we never heard anything about the Narragansett people or any uh, anything else in history about Indian people until in the spring and they'd uh, talk about the Trail of Tears. And uh, that was very frustrating to me because, you know, how did, we've been here all along, you know, uh, history didn't stop with Columbus and um, uh, we, we've been here. Um, why do people want to dress up and um, they do the wah wah hoop and uh, fake feathers and like we didn't exist and like we weren't there? Um, one of the hardest things for me to accept was when we left there, we went to school in Westerly, uh, Babcock Junior High School, and kids that had always been friends with me in Charlestown danced with me at school dances, we played together. When we got up there, suddenly they didn't know me anymore. Mm. And um, that was that was painful. That was painful. Um, there was a, Miss Burdick was my fifth grade teacher and she was my favorite teacher. She uh, was born and raised uh, not too far from Bucky Brook Trail. And um, she ha was the first person I ever knew to have a brand new car and it was a green Buick. Mm -hmm. And I've been driving Buicks ever since. <laughs> <laughs> when better cars are built. <laughs> but um, th there, was, there, was, there, w there was racism and prejudice, but by the same time, um, I don't really focus on those things because there were so many other good things going on in my life. I had a loving family, I had a lot of cousins, my grandparents. Um, going to the Indian church, the different Indian socials, the sons and daughters of the first America. Um, all of those things were so great. It just surpassed any racism. Did you talk to your parents about the, you know, some of these feelings that you had? You? I talked mostly with my father about it. Um, I can remember we were driving to Westerly. We went to Westerly every Friday to do our grocery shopping, pay the bills, get a block of ice or whatever it was. I think I was probably in the fifth of the sixth grade and um, I asked my father what the N-word was. And I said, 
set it out and he said, well, where did you hear that? And I said, well, in school I heard a child, somebody say it to another person, not to me, but I heard it and it bothered me. And so he said, well, when we get home, we'll look it up in the dictionary. And when we got home, uh, we looked it up and in the dictionary at that time it said it, somebody who was ignorant, d didn't have much knowledge or something to that extent. So he said, that's what it means. And that was good enough for me. So, um, you know, those things, those, <laughs> I, I have since learned that it's uh, other people's loss, not mine, if, if they can't accept the fact that they're here in our country and we're not going anywhere. We didn't come from some other place and uh, just move on from there. But because of the type of things that happened then, still happen, that's the reason my niece has opened the school. So you feel there's still a Yes, lot it's, pre it's very prevalent, uh, particularly at Cheraha. Yeah. Not so much in the elementary schools, although somewhat. Yeah. Which is sad. And so Dawn must have to deal with it all the time at Cheraha. Well, Dawn has stopped teaching at Cheraha because she couldn't she couldn't deal with it, and uh, it's because of um, my niece Loren was a school teacher for twelve and a half years in Newport, and her own child was dying on the vine in second or third grade because uh, he wasn't getting um, his needs met. He went in to school very happy and loving school, and after the first year, it went downhill, and she kept meeting with the school department and wasn't getting any results, so she decided that she would take a year off and homeschool that child and another son. And by that time, a third Indian, a second Indian woman said, well, would you homeschool my child? Mm -hmm. So at home, there were always uh, interruptions, telephone calls, people visiting. <clears throat> so she said to her mother, can I use the building next door to this facility? So her mother said, sure, go ahead. So after about three months, she said, I'm Paula, I want to open a school. I said, okay, <laughs> what do we do? So she says, well, I went online. She said, I don't want to charter school, but these are some of the things we need to do. So we ran around to the town hall and did a whole lot of different things that common sense told us to do. And then she, I said, well, uh, if this is going to be nonprofit, we'll have to come under the museum's 5013C. So then we had to go to the Attorney General's office and do all of that paperwork. And then uh, Loren said, well, I want to make sure I have accredited teachers. So I said, well, what do we do now? So she said, go to the school department. So we did that. So a man met us and he's, we had, we shuffled from one person to another. Finally, we got to the right person and he laughed at us and said, well, it'll take you a good couple of years before you can open. And he's telling Loren the things that are necessary. And he had this three sheets of paper and he set them out there. And I started, I can read very fast, I started going down and I was putting little mocks. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm checking off the things we've already done. So we were two thirds of the way already there. And we went the other third thanks to a lot of support from uh, friends at the museum, uh, one of the big expenses was being connected up to the local fire department. Um, there were also water issues and uh, it just went from there and it's been phenomenal. The children uh, that have graduated and left here. Are there any requirements to go into school there? Do you have to be uh, Native American? No, it's mm -hmm. been open to everybody. We've had non-Indians here. Uh, one particular family, it was a great family, the kids were doing great but the parents couldn't get up in the morning to get them here. So <laughs> <laughs> they didn't last. <laughs> yeah. um, so tell me a little bit uh, to go back about uh, starting up the restaurant here and your relationship to Hope Valley. Oh, well, you had bought this big place because I saw it and fell in love with it. And my husband had said nothing but mill houses up there, but when then he saw it and so of course, it was a big expense, and I worked in the Kenyon Mill. I worked there 10 years, and those last couple of years was when we had bought this. And I decided that 
it wasn't going to work with me working in the mill, I decided to open a guest house. So that's what I did. I sent her all these various friends and their friends and told them I was opening a guest house. So the first year was just fine. Well, my husband is, you probably remember, a great big man, but he never ever required that I had to get up and get breakfast. He always went down to the bakery and they have his coffee and whatever else he was having laid out when he got out of the car, when he got in there, it was there because he was going up to the post office. This was before he worked at the post oh, office. Oh, this was before he went to the post office. He was office. at EB then. Oh, yeah. But he oh, still yeah. never required you to fix breakfast. Yeah, but, yeah. So I had these guests coming. Well, it was fine, except that I didn't like getting up, pe getting, up getting people's breakfast either. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then I said, well, that's not working. This room was like this girl said, my daughter says, a playroom and the guests could use it and so forth. I decided that I would open up a restaurant. Well, first it was, I did the cooking in my regular, and then here, and my first and most faithful guest was, what was his name from Hope Valley? Uh, Oh gosh, I can't remember. Lucy, but, huh? Lucy Tutel? Who? Lucy Tutel? No. Uh -huh. Older than her. I can't remember her name. But anyhow, she would come and she would bring her books and she would, and I would serve tea and uh, whatever I had made for the, the sandwich of the day and it would be right in this room. And uh, then finally they decided to Oh, my husband, by this time he had been made, uh, was tax assessor first? No, he was town moderator. Town moderator. So I said, well, I'm going to, well, I was already serving food. So he said he was going to get a liquor license. I said, well, not in my home. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he said, well, how about if I go in that building? I said, that's okay if you want to go over there. I said, but it's not going to be in my home. So he did, and they issued the one just like that. So the bar was in downstairs. Now. Yeah, downstairs. downstairs. Yeah. Which, in the restaurant, the, that was his. Yeah. The restaurant was mine. <laughs> and I did say, I don't do any ordering for you. I don't want you to do any ordering me, for me. And the reason was some old farmer down in Hope Valley had a big bargain for him of these chickens, and he bought them. Well, these roosters must have been 40 years old. <laughs> I stewed them and stewed them and stewed them. And that's when we made the bargain. I would not interfere with downstairs and don't ever buy anything from me upstairs. <laughs> and every time, I can't remember the man's name, but every time I see him, he said, Mrs. Dove, would you like some more chickens? And I said, no, I don't want any more of your chickens. But anyhow, that's how the restaurant got over there was because he had decided he was going to ask for the slicker license. And I said, well, I'm not, not here. So. But the, the restaurant was here. The yes, here yes, here. yes. And I, we lived over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The kitchen is the the, the farthest end down, but that's okay. We we still yeah. serve yeah. the food and so but, forth. Uh, it was it was nice because we had neighbors up the road. If one happened to be an architect, so he worked with my dad and mom um, designing the restaurant mm -hmm. and how it was going to be, and um, we kids loved it because uh, particularly the first opening. What after a while it was really. A restaurant, restaurant, but we had small ice cream freezers so we kids could get, you know, ice cream and um, go down to the valley. It was always chocolate, vanilla, and coffee. Never any variety, those three. But it was ice cream and you're out here in the country, so you were, you were happy, happy to get that. But uh, when my children were born, her first couple of grandchildren, their big thing was to go with Graham and grandfather to the A&P, which my mm -hmm. oldest son always called the NOP, Grammy's mm -hmm. NOP store. <laughs> and uh, she Tell me where that was. It was down right in the middle of Hope Valley, over where the bakery is now, now located. And um, 
the the thing of it was even while it was there and even after it moved the grandparents could take these grandchildren and they always came home with something in their hand. Mm -hmm. And my brother and sisters, not my baby sister, but my sister Dawn and I wondered, how did that always happen? They always managed to come home with something from the <laughs> NOP store. <laughs> but um, it was, it was um, like a hustling, bustling town and then um, when they moved the A and P, it seemed to die down, and we used to call it Hopeless Valley. And now it's such a pleasure to go through. I always want to kiss Mrs. Um, uh, Botel because she has well, this year. She always has beautiful flowers, but she had the pink and purple flowers on the mm -hmm. front of her house. And as you see each house being restored down there, and you you, you know, it, you give that sense of pride. You can tell the people that are living there have that pride. Um, the church has wonderful flowers and things out in front of it. It's just like a whole regrowth of going back to perhaps like how it was 80 years ago. Yeah. And um, it's, it's nice to see that. We've just uh, found the same thing when we started mm -hmm. to look at it. Mm -hmm. really it was yeah. went through, I think in the early, uh, early part of the 20th century, mm -hmm. It was quite bustling and quite oh, yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then when the depression hit and the hurricane hit, mm -hmm. and yeah. everything and the mills burned and the people yeah. were out of yeah. work, it's right. Yeah, it was a whole different. But it's it, amazing. Yeah. It, so you remember Hope Valley? Yeah, I, I have fond memories of. I can remember my father and my brother going down to the barber shop. Um, I always loved the smell of the barber shop for some reason. Don't ask me why. But mm -hmm. <laughs> in those days, I wore my hair real short, almost like a man's. And my father would say, well, go to the barber shop and have it cut, which was a lot cheaper than going to the hairdresser. So a couple of times I got my, my hair cut down there. And um, of course, the, the other thing was uh, the drugstore. Um, they had the ice cream parlor and they had um, the old fashioned floor with the little octagon pieces in there. And uh, at the ice cream counter, they had the uh, stainless steel cups and they put the paper cups and you get your, your ice cream. Uh, it, it was great. My, my brother Mark um, had a dog named Sandy and he went everywhere with my brother, whether he was on a bicycle or when he turned 16 driving a car, 17, and he would take Sandy with him. And he would buy Sandy a, coffee, a cone of coffee ice cream every time he went to the bakery. <laughs> that was the big thing. He might not buy his girlfriend one, but the dog got one. So it was, that was a lot of fun. But when you moved to Hope Valley, there was no uh, train. It had no. 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 What was there where the park is going to go, Depot Square Park in Hope Valley, across from the bakery next to the fire station? What was there that you remember? Can't remember. I think it was, uh, well, Western was Auto. Western Auto. Yeah, yes, yes, you're right. Western Auto was there. He did a lot of shopping there. And, yes, <laughs> yes. And was the post office across from there then? It, what, it, the post office came in afterwards on the oh. end. On one mm -hmm. end of the yeah. building. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. right. And then, of course, there was always Woodbinsies. Uh, mm. uh, Gussie and what? Ginger. Ginger. They got married mm. over in the, the restaurant. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, they did. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. So, uh, now we've heard a lot about Howdy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She always had uh, um, different groups were always meeting here: the Mantra mm -hmm. Dimes, PTA, um, Business and Professional Women, Charho Business and Business. The Charho the Char Char branch of the BPW was organized mm -hmm. here. Here first. Yeah, the first meeting, first get together. But there was no question that you would keep it open after your husband died? Well, uh, Mr. Botel was a lawyer, mm -hmm. and I was here a year and still in the restaurant. Didn't know anything about downstairs, because of course I'd made that pact that I wouldn't bother with his, <laughs> he didn't bother mine. <laughs> and and uh, I knew things were disappearing, and I just wasn't able to cope with both. And Mr. Botel sat on the bus and he said, I think it's time you did something. This is just too much. And then he came back and he says, I have a buyer for you. So that, that was that. I, I went ahead and sold it. 
and I sold it to uh, Quatrimini's, and they stayed here 10 years. And then uh, the brother, I can't remember his name, he has a big place down the beach, Quatrimini. Well, anyhow, he was, he was younger than the one that was here, and he took over the mortgage, and he called me, and uh, Oh, I called him because they had moved to Florida. Because people were coming up, just taking whatever they wanted. So the last time I called him, I said, well, Tom called, called to me. I said, there's a couple of young men, did you send them? They're taking the big air conditioner off of the top of the restaurant. So he said, no, I didn't send them. He said, Mrs. Dunn, why don't you buy that place back? So I said, well, it's not worth anything. I said, your brother and sister-in-law the restaurant business went right down to nothing. They never did any repairs in the whole time. So he said, well, make me a, a offer. So I said, well, this isn't really worth anything. I won't say how much I sold it for, but I told him, I said, not worth more than $50,000. So he said, well, I couldn't let it go for that because my mortgage is more than that. So I said, well, what's your mortgage? Well, it was a few thousand more than that. And I said, okay. I said, can I have a couple of days to give you a definite answer? So he said, yes. Tom said, yes. He said, my wife won't even go up there. She's so disgusted with the place. So I called my kids from the oldest one down. My, my daughter-in-law, who I love dearly, but she's just, she's just a ma. She said, I'm not killing myself over that big black stove. <laughs> <laughs> and this one said, I'm a lone woman. She's a divorcee. She said, what would I do with it? And Dawn said, oh, I don't know, Ma. She was in a relationship, but not a husband. And she said, I don't know. I can't, can't give you any answer on that. The littlest one, Lori, she and Lawrence, she said, oh, she said, we've got this little postage stamp lawn and Lawrence moans about mowing that. What's he going to do with two or three acres to, to mow? So then Dawn called me back and she and her friends decided that they would, she said, well, we can, we're, we're going to try it, Ma. I said, okay. Well, of course, being a mother, she said, we can do it if you can let us have something for the down payment now on my own land. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, if you promise you're going to pay it back. So she said, yes, I promise. And she did. And then that's when she got it. And she took it. And I was glad that, I was just happy that somebody in the family felt for it and was able to do it. And she was able to do it. And Who's that was good. The museum? Uh, the, the museum. The museum. Princess Red Wing really was a... The museum was started by, by Red Wing and, and um, Anthropologist for Connecticut College in Tomaquad Valley in Ashaway. And when Mrs. Butler, who was the woman, uh, passed away, um, they closed, the, the family closed the museum. So some of the things in the collections came with Red Wing. Red Wing was a woman uh, whose husband was best friend of my, my parents, my father. And Red Wing, of course, has always been involved in the Indian community. And she came over for Sunday brunch and stayed for 20 years. <laughs> and uh, we had a shed out in the back, and the things she had went into that collection. Uh, when my oldest son, Sean, uh, was killed over in Mystic Village, I had been working in the restaurant and I, I couldn't deal with people and an opportunity came up to be an intern at the Boston Children's Museum, so I did that. And I had like a two hour drive up and a two hour drive back and by the time I came home and gave my two remaining children dinner, uh, spent a little time with them, I could crash and sleep. And. Uh, I, after being an intern for one year, I was hired to direct the internship the second year. And um, the year I was there, I, everybody had to do a project. Mine was on baskets because I love baskets. And my sister Dawn uh, was an intern the following year, and she worked to get the museum's 5013C. Um, in the restaurant, when they opened 
They didn't have any money after they'd bought walk-in refrigerators and restaurant equipment and chairs and tables and all of those kind of good things. And so we decorated with family pictures and artifacts around and people kept calling it an Indian restaurant. We're saying, why do they call it an Indian restaurant? <laughs> and, and customers would come in because my mother always felt the family had to eat together. And she had a regular menu with chicken chops, steak, Like whatever, everybody else. Like everybody else. And they said, oh, what are you having? That smells good. She said, oh, uh, we're, we're having a quahog chowder or, or we're having fried oysters and johnny cakes or we're having corned beef hash or something. And the regular customers said, well, we want the same thing you're eating. So that's how it evolved to an Indian restaurant. Yeah, because it started out a menu just yeah, like everybody else. else. And then um, we had uh, a big... Um, barbecues and we would have a, a big clam bake once a year and busloads of people would come and uh, so my father said well we needed that shed to put the equipment in there and so but we had all these artifacts and things in there from Red Wing and uh, my parents closed in they had a, a shelter out in the back just the top and they put a, a cement floor in and so uh, they eventually put sides on and, and then they designed cabinets and we called ourselves a museum. But then mm -hmm. when we went for the 5013C, uh, we couldn't be behind a commercial building. Mm -hmm. And this was my parents, yes. this was trading post then. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course the restaurant over next door. So we had to move it to another building. And uh, when Dawn and um, uh, Melvin Coombs came here, um, she said that we could move the museum back in here, and mm -hmm. we did, and it's been great. It's been great. The nice part was uh, my mother, for four or five years, had her trading post in what was her dining room and her TV room and the kitchen. So it was like coming home. Mm -hmm. And one day, I, I don't know what she was doing, but she had tea and something else she was cooking. And I'm telling you, the flashbacks came <laughs> not heavy because this, this was always home. So it's great to be here. Yeah. Where, where was Princess Redwing from? She wasn't from Rhode Island, was she? she yes. Was from, she was from well, Rhode she grew up in uh, Glasgow. Glasgow, Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah. But she's always been here in Rhode but, Island. But Graham Glasgow lived in, in Rhode Island. She was born in... Oh, oh, no. I can't remember now. I know she was born in Versailles, Connecticut. Uh-huh. Because... But then they had a farm in northern Rhode Island. Yeah. I can't think of the town. I don't remember it either. But, but she was always involved in... in uh, Indian community. Um, was she in Narragansett? She was Narragansett she was in Narragansett. Wampanoag. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And um, she was the, the first uh, Indian woman to speak at the UN. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt invited her there. Mm -hmm. uh, she started the first uh, and published the first uh, Indian magazine by, for, and about Indian people, the Narragansett Dawn, um, during the 30s. Mm -hmm. uh, she taught, did missionary work, she was a school teacher, she read tea leaves mm -hmm. in New York to send herself to art school. Mm -hmm. uh, she was phenomenal. She read tea leaves here every Tuesday and we would have people that came for tea leaves lined up waiting for a table and so then in the summer we put a table outside and the waitress would say, She's making more money than we are. <laughs> and they had to do all the work, taking the tea and the teacups out. And I did use nice china. I didn't use the restaurant where I used nice china cups, you know, for, for the tea leaves. And she got them. And this is true. She had one av aviator who came every time he was going to make a long trip and have any of his family on board. And he would always ask her, was it okay for him to take her, his family? And he would not take them until he came to see her, and she said it was okay for him to take his family on board when he was uh, flying. It was, it was really quite something. Sometimes. Uh, Red Wing was, she was a phenomenal woman and funny. She always kept alive, but my parents always took the, the month of February off and they would travel. And she kept a day-to-day -day log of what went on, the weather, who came, and, and different things that, that happened. 
and uh, she they they were usually very humorous, and I don't think she really meant them to be humorous, <laughs> but she had a good sense of humor. Uh, my mother had the trading post, and it was really going good. She decided she was going to order um, bags that said Dovecrest Trading Post, a variety of sizes, and an, a native design on the front of them. Well, the truck came, and I guess she misunderstood how many bags were in a gross. <laughs> <laughs> and she, some of them around <laughs> she had, there were so many boxes that filled this room back here. Red Wing sat right down and wrote the funniest poem about we have bags. <laughs> have you found that? It's probably still in some I, of the it's, I, I still haven't found the poem. I know it's here somewhere, but I found a lot of funny things. And then over in the restaurant in the bar, uh, Red Wing was not a bartender or supposed to be tending bar, but sometimes whoever was going to be tending to the bar would be late. And so this one day, they said, oh, Red Wing, when you go down there, nobody's going to be there. They're not going to drink any drinks. They'll just have a beer. So uh, a person <laughs> ordered a beer, and so she put the beer up, and she put the glass up, and she said, well, dear, would you like a straw? And <laughs> I said, please don't send her down again. <laughs> And of course, that was a big joke to her, because a lot of people thought she was either my fa my mother or Ferris, um, or Ferris' mother, but she wasn't. Uh, now, Ferris took a place. He had a number of different jobs. I know. He, uh, you said he was town moderator. Was he also postmaster? Yes. I yes. Yes. Yeah. He was postmaster up in Rockville. Yeah. And yeah. then, because they had a big article in the paper about Indian buys post office, <laughs> <laughs> and he did buy the the post office building, which I still own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he loved being at the post office mm -hmm. because he's a people person. Mm -hmm. um, after he had been had the job, he was also, <clears throat> well, he had to give up being tax assessor for Exeter and town moderator for Exeter, but he was still politically active in a lot of poli mm -hmm. political things with the tribe and outside of the tribe. And he also uh, was, uh, very interactive with Bacon Indian College, where he, which he graduated from in Oklahoma. So he went to all of their different conferences and fundraisers and different things. So mm -hmm. uh, one time he called me. Now by this time I'm living in East Providence, away from all this dreaded country. <laughs> and uh, he called me, so I need you to tend to the post office. So I said, oh, okay. So I got to the post office and he's telling me how to do everything. and how you have to balance your book at the end of the day, and so forth and so on. So he gives me all this information. So I said, well, where's the bathroom? So he said, oh, come right here. <laughs> now, I didn't. I knew the post office in Rockville was old, and I knew at one time there might have been like a little general store in there and a gas station on the back end. Well, he takes me out to this back end, and... Um, there are the, the old metal signs that show that it had been uh, uh, something to do with cars, you know, buying motor oil and so forth. And he took me down to this corner and he walked up a step and there was an indoor, outdoor house <laughs> with a throne. <laughs> it was like on the throne. I said, oh my God. <laughs> so, so, I learned you didn't take, drink a whole lot until, you know, in the morning. And it was wonderful when my father was there because uh, he talked to everybody. He was very gregarious and all the people that came through, whether they were tourists, summer people, the village people, he knew everybody. But every day before he left, he would call my mother, who would be in the restaurant, what do you need at the A&P? And she would give him her list of things that he was to stop at the A&P and bring back uh, home at, at the, you know, at his lunch break. And uh, my father loved, my father was a big man, six foot two, very gregarious. His name was Roaring Bull, and when he spoke, he always said, I'm not yelling! <laughs> but he was a tender-hearted person, and he had all kinds of birds that came out in the yard, and he fed them every day at the same time. So when he'd go on these conferences, the main thing was take care of the post office, make sure you're there before it's supposed to open, and make sure you stay five minutes after it's supposed to close, just in case. And 
uh, but get home in time to feed the birds. Well, being a woman, and I would also get the phone call, stop and pick up such and such at the store, and I would pick it up because my father said, you always do business locally. You might get the majority of your things elsewhere, but always take care of your neighbors and make sure that you do business locally. So we did. Well, I would come in and I would be late and I'd be dragging the things into the restaurant or the walk-in refrigerator, which was around in the back. And the birds would be out there just, just looking at me, just waiting. And it was like they were singing, mm -hmm. you're late, you know, <laughs> not here. Uh, it was great growing up here. So we were talking about how uh, Eleanor and Ferris met. Could you tell oh. me a little bit about... Uh, <laughs> How that happened? Well, it happened because my cousin Dara Spears and her brothers and my aunt Beattie and Uncle Ed had moved to Charlestown. And Dara called up and said, there's a big dance at Infantry Hall in the city and we are coming up and we're bringing her brothers and two handsome young men. One named Milton Perry and one named Ferris Dove. So my Aunt Mary, my father's youngest sister, who was just three years older than me, said, yes, we'd be at the dance. Well, of course, we really thought we were hot stuff and knew everything. <laughs> and so anyhow, they were there. Country people, of course, they were there when the door opened. But we wanted to make a big entrance. Fashionably late. <laughs> so we were fashionably late. We walk into Infantry Hall, and you walk in, and you walk out, and then you can see down the end. Well, here's all these people from the country down the end. And I looked down and said, hmm, I'll take the tall one. <laughs> <laughs> so he thought he was pursuing me <laughs> for the next two or three years, but I had already made up my mind. I said, I'll poor take the dad. tall one. Poor and the dad. thing is, hmm? I said, poor dad. He never, knew, never saw it coming. He never knew what was happening. <laughs> and the, the strange thing was, his best friend was Milton Perry. Mary married Milton a year after Ferris and I were married. <laughs> oh, <wonderful. laughs> yeah. and they, my mother and father were the first people to get married inside the Indian church mm -hmm. in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And people had gotten married outside, but not inside. And I was the second person to get married inside. And yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Was this gathering in this dance, was it for Indians? Was it a, or was no, it was for, it was for, a, for anybody. Ah. Mm -hmm. What was an Indian wedding like? Well, is it different? the minister, I still have the paper, the minister from the Baptist Church in Charlestown, I can't remember the name, did the civil ceremony and the Native American ceremony where Ferris wrapped me in his blanket was by Ernest Hazard. And that's we had the, the two weddings at the same time. The first Part of the culture was to wrap the, uh, yes, the bride. Yes, yes. And, uh, and so that, that's, and then we went up to a place called Tweedledum, Tweedledee. Tweedledee. Tweedledee, and that was first Aunt Mary Johnson. That was Aunt Bell. Yep, yeah, Aunt Bell, that's Bell. Babcock. Mm -hmm. And they had a reception there for us. And it was really, really unique. What was your maiden name? Spears. It was a Spears? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, uh, Babcock, well, is it Walter Babcock that I knew who's on the town council? Uh, He's a cousin of my father's. Mm -hmm. Very nice man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and would an Indian bride do something <coughs> special for her Indian husband in a wedding ceremony? No, no. I didn't. At so, that, that, we didn't at that time. So it was a man wrapping mm -hmm. you in a blanket. Mm -hmm. and what mm -hmm. did the blanket look like? It was a Native American blanket that my mother-in-law had given to him to wrap his bride in. Um, tell me a little bit more, because uh, Paul, you had mentioned um, that there were social events at the church. And that it, as an Indian child growing up outside of Carolina, what was life like, and what was life like? What was what do you remember about 
Carolina as you were growing up as well? Well, one of the nice things I remember about Carolina, uh, we had a bus driver whose name was Mr. Russell. Uh, Mr. Russell, there was an ice cream stand that made homemade ice cream. Um, if you're coming from this direction, it was on the left-hand side. I can't remember the name of it, yeah, but you could get you could get ice cream uh, for a nickel or a dime. And most of the Indian kids didn't have a nickel or a dime, but he would tell us the day before, okay, to, it was about once a month, but maybe twice a month, he'd say, okay, tomorrow's ice cream day. Well, you'd be around the house trying to, you know, find pennies or anything, and if you didn't have it, all the children would get their ice cream, they had money, and then Mr. Russell was so good. Those of us that didn't have it, he would buy each of us a, con a nickel cone of ice cream, so we all had one. And I never, ever forgot that. I just thought that was, I mean, it might not have seemed like much in today's society, but it meant a lot to me and for the rest of us kids that didn't. And sometimes it was uh, white kids also that might not have the nickel that was on the, on the bus. Um, so that was one special memory about Carolina. Uh, of course, I always loved um, the fact that the school was right near the train tracks and the trains going through because my grandfather was a railroad policeman and he lived in Westerly and it was great he'd say uh, there goes the uh, 502 New, <laughs> New Haven, there goes the 704 uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, he knew each train that was coming through and in those days trains actually used their whistle and it's not all high tech like it is now so I always wondered grandfather on that train when it was going by. He probably wasn't, be, but in my mind as a child, um, that, was, that was pretty special to me. Another special thing that happened, um, it was 1946 and I was in the first grade and my first grade teacher's, first grade teacher's name was Miss Crandall. Um, she wasn't very friendly, but she was my teacher and so I really respected her and uh, we had a cloakroom. They had two doors that you went in and you hung your, your jackets and your coats up and you put your bags, right, or your lunch bag or your, or your lunch bucket, whatever you had, if you had one, um, right where your, your coat or jacket or sweater was hung. And I can remember 1946. Oh, because it was a big lot, you know, quite a lot of land, but he was plowing and he plowed right up to the door and the carriage is right up against the house and <laughs> the fellow went right up onto the, to the carriage. So, yeah, so that's, that's when we decided to look for something else and then I had heard about the Chimawaki Lodge being, looking for caretakers. Okay, right, <laughs> now, going back to 1946. <laughs> oh, well, 1946, because um, the war, I can remember um, buying stamps uh, you saved them to buy a war bond, and um, I remember the parades in Westerly, which was wonderful, and I had a lot of family members that were in the service, including um, two of my mother's brothers, and uh, they were both in the Navy, and uh, we knew about the Navy base, and when the planes would go over, my brother and I would stand outside and wave to them because we said, maybe that's Uncle Joe or Uncle mm -hmm. Donald. Well, so Navy always had kind of special thought to me, but I was mm -hmm. in the first grade and this man came in in a naval uniform. Now, I knew it wasn't my uncle, it wasn't the right color, and he and Miss Crandall went in the cloakroom and they kissed, <laughs> which was shocking. <laughs> but yet it was wonderful because this was somebody that came home. Right. And I believe they ended up getting married and she became Mrs. Thayer. <laughs> <laughs> but I remembered that. And it was uh, over in Charlestown where we lived. Um, it was a dirt road and there was another dirt road. Uh, and we would all be at my mom and dad's house and, and we still had kerosene lamps in those days. And uh, in those days you could hear when there was a vehicle like three miles away. And, so oh, a car is coming and they would be playing cards and talking and laughing, drinking coffee or whatever. And so no, I didn't hear one. My father said, yeah, I heard a car. So 
a quarter of a mile away, we'd see this light, or maybe a half mile away. So, yeah, I saw a light through the woods. Well, we're all looking and looking and looking, and suddenly we turned down Buckeye Brook Trail and stopped right out in the road in front of the house, and it was a cab, a yellow cab. <laughs> the most amazing thing to see any vehicle come up and down the road, but a yellow cab. And who gets out? Her brother Donald. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was like, <laughs> I'm going to heaven. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th those were those were special things about uh, growing up and remembering the war. Um, my mother lost a brother, my Uncle Joe, uh, in the war, but they would come down from the city, East Providence, which in those days was a lot of farmland, they called it the city now, but they would come down. One of the greatest things to me was that my uncles, her two brothers, slept outside in the apple tree on a bed. <laughs> and I guess they both survived in the morning because they were still there. Um, but over the stove there was a shelf, over the wood stove, and on the shelf there would be a box of oatmeal, a box of cream of wheat, and a box of wheat tina. And I had three uncles, Uncle Donald, Uncle Joe, and the Uncle Buster. And each one of those were one of those cereals, and my mother would say, what kind of cereal do you want today? Oh, I guess I'll have Uncle Donald today. Oh, I'm going to have Uncle Buster today. And those were the three cereals. And so it was, it was just a lot of fun. Uh, in the winter, when it would seem like it was the coldest and the worst time, my father wouldn't be in, ha have good much, much luck in hunting, so we didn't have rabbit or deer or, or, or much meat. There, would, there were always, always potatoes and Johnny cakes. But then my mother would whip out some of her uh, blueberries that she had preserved <laughs> and make a blueberry pie. <laughs> and it didn't matter what else you had there because she had all of this beautiful sweetness <laughs> from the summer. <laughs> uh, so it, it was, it was, growing up there was wonderful. We had quince trees, she made jelly, uh, she canned, she just did everything. And she was a phenomenal woman. She didn't tell you that while she worked at Kenyon Mill, and while she was doing the restaurant here, she ran a catering business at the same time. No, Red Star <laughs> Catering, wow. and they catered to all over Connecticut and Watch, Watch Hill and <laughs> everywhere. So, you know, uh, the workaholics, she still wears my sister and I out. We keep saying she works so hard that we're tired. So, you know, if you don't move things, the dust will stay there. Well, she doesn't believe that. She, Oh, well, <laughs> um, let me ask you, because I know I need to wrap mm -hmm. up and um, need to give you guys a rest. Um, can I ask you just to go the other direction from school into Carolina? Did you ever go further than the Beresford's ice cream store? Um, was there any reason to go further into Carolina? Sure. Do you remember what it looked like? All th The thing I remember once, there were a lot of trees and going to the Octagon House. I loved to go by the Octagon House. That was always something. And there was an <laughs> Octagon House in Providence. Uh, before there was a 95, the way you went to the city, we would pass that Octagon House. And I thought that was the most unusual thing. I always, I've never been inside, but I've always thought about what do the rooms do look like? Are they pieces of pie? You know, a, a child's image of it. And also, the water uh, from where the factory uh, was at one time. Um, Can the you describe that? Well, it was always rushing. It was always bubbling. It was always churning. It was a beautiful sound. But when you went through Carolina, the way the trees kind of curved over. They still do. But even more so mm -hmm. in, in those days. It was just, it was like out of a postcard. And all, the, all the, the yards were always kept up, and there were different, the old style plantings. Um, not all cut and polished, and, but just, just a nice settled look about it. And on the corner, I, uh, it's a place that used to burn, that burned a couple of years ago, or a year ago, um, Mr. Wright used to sell Hudson cars. And those Hudsons were huge, overgrown <laughs> cars. The biggest cars I can ever remember. But when we come, the school bus, we come across the railroad tracks and uh, 
come down the road into Carolina, and right on the right-hand side would be those great big Hudsons. And there was an uh, Indian woman whose name was Adele Rhodes, uh, who had a Hudson. And as she got older, she got smaller and more and more stooped. And I think at one time she might have been five foot three, but by the time, time I remember, she was probably four foot eight. And she drove this Hudson, and she was so tiny that you'd only see the very top of her head. And she would drive, and she didn't go over 20 miles an hour. And sometimes there would be 30 cars behind her because they couldn't get by that great big Hudson. And <laughs> when I turned 16, my mother said, Oh, you're going to be getting your license. Well, Adele isn't driving anymore. Maybe you can, we can buy her car for you. And I was dying. I did not want that great big Hudson. <laughs> Fortunately, my father got me a nice little conservative Chevrolet. <laughs> but I, I do remember the, that part of, of going there. And also, it was the, my first experience of knowing about foster children. I never heard of them. And there was a girl uh, whose name was Lois Jenkins. And she was being, uh, there was a house on the hill right near uh, where the, the garage was where Mr. Wright sold the, the Hudsons. Uh, Lois Jenkins was a foster child. And I didn't know it until I believe we were in the sixth grade and she said her father was coming to get her, and she hated her foster mother because her foster mother used to slap her. And she told me about that. And she, she slapped me because she'd come in with a big mark on the side of her face. And she was so happy when her father came and took her. I think he was in World War II. I'm not quite sure what, what happened there. But um, I couldn't believe that they were foster children and that there were parents that didn't take care of their children and loved their children. Now, I might have been like a foster child, uh, but my parents were always there. I lived with my father's grandmother and father in Westerly. I lived with my mother's mother and father in East Providence. And then my father was in the hospital sick uh, with cancer. I stayed with cousins down the road, the Spearses. And as long as my toothbrush was there, I was home, and I knew I was loved. So I never thought about foster children. And I, that was, I don't know what made me think of that, what I did. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.